All right, guys, it's good to be good to be back in the pulpit this week. Good to be back with you guys. I know I was sitting out there getting to see it the way you see it. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't see myself up here, so I don't really know what it's like. But I can always watch the video, and I do. I encourage you to go watch the sermons on video. Make sure you hit like and subscribe. Now we're on, now I'm a YouTuber. Now I'm a YouTuber. All right. <laughs> I want to go viral. Come on. <laughs> For our sermon this week, we are going to be looking at one of our lectionary readings. And so I've been doing this lately, looking at some of our lectionary readings. And we've looked at in the past couple of weeks ago when I was with you and a couple of weeks before that, we looked at some of the passages in Hebrews. And we're going to do that again today. So let's turn back to our first scripture reading of the day. In Hebrews chapter 10, and we're going to look at the first part of what we read, verses 11 to 14. I'm not going to read the whole passage again. I'll just read the last verse of the text we're going to look at. Hebrews chapter 10, we'll look at 11 to 14, and I'm just going to read verse 14. One of the most amazing verses in the New Testament about what Christ our Lord has done for us as our Savior Hebrews 10, 14. This is a good one to memorize. If you're into memorizing verses of the Bible, this is a good one. For by a single offering, by a single offering, He has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Praise the Lord. Let's ask Him to bless our time in His Word today. Father, we give You thanks and praise for Your Word. We thank You for the gift that it is. And we thank you for the power that it has. And we ask you to speak this word afresh and anew into our hearts, into our lives. And may you do all your work in us. Teach us today. Teach us to believe all that you say. And give us eagerness to go and do all that you command. And we'll give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Sometimes, when I'm doing dishes, I think about the absolute futility of that chore. I love to get every dish perfectly clean. I wash the dishes that I put into the dishwasher. Okay? I pre-wash them, and then I wash them, wash them. I like having a nice, clean, sparkly kitchen. All the dishes are in the dishwasher. It's running. All the ones that wouldn't fit are hand-washed. They're sitting there stacked up beautifully so where they won't fall, and they're dripping, and they're drying. And I've sanitized everything. And it is just like a commercial, sparkling, beautiful. I'm, all, I'm going bald, so it's like Mr. Clean almost. I'm working on it. <laughs> And, and I stem back, and I look at my kitchen, and I think, ah. Oh. And then this horrible feeling comes over me. I'm going to have to do this again tomorrow. <laughs> Why can't I just do the dishes once and they stay clean? Well, it's because we're going to use those dishes tomorrow. Those same stinking dishes are going to be just as dirty tomorrow. The same counter is going to have to be wiped down again. The same stove is going to have to be... And it's not just dishes. When I vacuum, I just think, oh, man, look how beautiful this floor is. I can walk barefoot and not have to step on pet hair and dirt and grit. Oh, I just run around barefoot. And then the next day... Well, the next week, it's just going to, that, that same dirt, we have the same stinking pets with the same fur and the same dust, and it's just, and it's just the futility of it. <laughs> it's just, you, you keep doing these chores over and over, and it never stays clean, and it never stays finished, and you just have to do it again. Things just get dirty all over again. I'm going to have to walk my dog again because it has to go to the bathroom. It has to. <laughs> and so I have to take it out. <laughs> These litter boxes have to be scooped again and again, and it just never ends, the futility of it. I feel like reading the book of Ecclesiastes. The monotony and the tedium 
(laughs) of our everyday lives can tend to lead to such boredom and frustration and melancholy, even depression and cynicism, our daily lives sometimes can turn into this rut we cannot get out of. I have to do the same stinking stuff again today, and it's always the same over and over and over. And Lord help the perfectionists among you who have to get it absolutely stinking perfect because you're just going to be so frustrated tomorrow <laughs> and so tired tomorrow. You know, I was listening to a song um, a while back. A song came out a few years, and, and uh, it had a, the opening line touched on this, this sort of theme I'm talking about. And the opening line of the song says... I'm not going to sing. I'm just going to say it. You're welcome. The opening line of the song says, Time is an object in the sky. It's measured by the rate you pass it by. Every year you go around, have a party, wear a crown, and you do it just like that until you die. (laughs) What an uplifting song. And that kind of captures it. You know, beyond just the daily grind and the tedium, life, here's another birthday, here's Christmas, again. (laughs) More presents, the same old thing, here we go, here we go. You know, the repetitiveness of the tedium of our everyday lives. For so many people in our society, in our culture, in our, maybe even in our own homes, maybe even in our own selves, For so many, this can become a daily reminder of the life we're unhappy with. Of the life that we're kind of tired of. We're kind of over it. And we feel stuck in this life. I'm stuck in this perception that everyone has of me. I'm stuck in these routines. I'm stuck in this job. I'm stuck in this role. I'm stuck with these expectations. I am trapped. The everyday can become a daily reminder of the life we're stuck in, the rut we cannot get out of, the cycle we cannot escape. And it can, and for so many it does, give a sense of the real futility that we find in a book like Ecclesiastes, where the author says in chapter 1, verse 9, what has been will be again. Everything that's happened before is just going to happen again. There's nothing new under the sun. The sun comes up, and it sets, and then it hurries back to where it's supposed to rise again, and round and round we go, vanity of vanities. It just starts to feel meaningless. And in our passage this morning, the author of Hebrews feels a little bit of that same futility feels a little bit of this same monotony, but not about daily chores. He feels this same sort of futility about the priesthood and the sacrificial system under the old covenant. As an ancient Jewish person, he's reflecting on the differences between the old covenant and what has come in Christ. And he's looking back at the old covenant and he sees the repetitiveness of it, and he feels the futility of it. Just look at verse 11 in our text, Hebrews 10, 11. And just, you can almost hear his voice, the the fatigue, the tiredness in his voice. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices. You can just, can you hear it? Can you hear him? He's just, his pen is writing slower on the parchment at this point. (sighs) Every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which what? Can never take away sins. He says, every priest Every priest, 
And here he's thinking not just of the priest in his day. He's thinking all the way back to the first priest, the brother of Moses, Aaron. (laughs) He's thinking back the thousand plus years before he wrote these words to Moses and Aaron. And every priest since then for depending on how you date these things, 1,200 or even as many as 1,400 years worth of priests, one after another, every priest, one after another, from Moses and Aaron all the way down to his own day, centuries of priests, so many lives. Every priest stands daily, day after day. These priests get up in the morning and they go to work and they perform the same tasks the same rituals, the exact same way as written every day. And they stand daily offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, these same old, same old animals, right? Another goat, another sheep, another bull, another turtle dove, another this, another that, the same old sacrifices that we keep doing over and over and over, and we've done it this way ever since Moses, and they never take away our sins. And you can just feel the author looking back on this and saying, all these sacrifices, all those priests, all this ritual, all this activity, and at the end of the day, I know I'm just going to have to offer another sacrifice tomorrow. We're just going to have to offer another one on Yom Kippur, the day of atonement. We're just going to have to keep doing this year after year, day after day. It's never going to stop, and you can feel him stuck in this cycle of, I still have, I want my sins gone, (laughs) And these things just don't seem to be doing it. And for this author, he says, these sacrifices that are ordained by God, I mean, they're doing this in obedience to the law that God gave. This is what God asked for. (laughs) But he never intended these sacrifices to save people from their sins. They were meant to purify them ritually, ceremonially, so they could go in and out of the temple and be close to God's presence. But these things were never meant to cleanse the conscience, to cleanse the soul, to remove sin from within, just to ritually purify us in a ceremonial way. And they're perfect for that, but they don't take away sins. They don't work for that. And so when this author looks back, he says, these animals, these priests, this stuff at the temple, all this sacrifice, to me it's nothing but a reminder of the futility of it all. It just reminds me every day that my sins actually aren't taken away after all. I still have them. I take my animal to the priest. I watch him do the sacrifice. And I stand back and it gets to the point where he's like, how many times am I going to have to come here and do this? I'm just going to go home a sinner still. Clean for a day. Dirty again tomorrow. Those dishes are clean for now. I got to wash them tomorrow. And yeah, these animals may be at work today, but it's just a reminder. I got to do this again tomorrow. And I'm still a sinner. And I still need a Savior. If you back up to the beginning of the chapter, he says this. Chapter 10, verse 1, since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities, talking about when Christ arrives, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. They just can't do it. And then he says this, otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered? (laughs) Like, if these sacrifices worked, why are we still offering them? If they really worked and they really took away my sin, how come I still have to do them? Why does another animal have to go through this? How many sacrifices is it going to take? And then he says in in, um, chapter 10, verse 3, he said, But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. They just remind me of my sin. And he says in verse 4, For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. 
You know, the author here makes me think about a, a riddle that was told by the Roman emperor Marcus Aurelius. Marcus Aurelius is not just a famous emperor. He was also a Stoic philosopher, and we still have his private journal that he wrote. And he's, in that journal, he just talks to himself. And he tells a riddle in there. I've always liked this. And the riddle goes, how many animals can you fit in your stomach? I first read that and I thought, maybe a small squirrel or you know, maybe, I don't know, how many animals can I fit in my stomach? At one time, what are we talking about here? It's a riddle. How many animals can you fit in your stomach? And the answer is, there's no limit. A limitless number of animals can fit in your stomach. Just think about how many meals you've eaten throughout your life that had meat in it. If we put all those parts back together, how many animals would be in your stomach? That's the riddle. There's no end to how much you can eat. <laughs> There's no end to how many animals can fit in your stomach. And I think the author of Hebrews would tell a similar riddle. Except his riddle might be, how many animals does it take to wash away your sins? Limitless. There's no end in sight. Think of how many animals went through the sacrificial system. How much blood was spilled on the altar. From Moses all the way down to the day the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, all those centuries later. How many drops of blood would that be if you put it back together? Rivers of blood. How much blood is it going to take to wash this sinner clean? Think about the ark with Noah. I mean, the flood was supposed to take care of all the sinners. And yeah, what we learn from Genesis is that, yeah, the, the flood was great. Great for wiping out sinners, but it couldn't wash away sin. Because those people got off that boat and they were still sinful. How much blood has to flow? How many animals have to be sacrificed? What's it going to take for us to escape the cycle, the futility, the never-ending repetitiveness of all these sacrifices? Now, maybe that question that felt so real and raw and vital to the author of the Hebrews feels a little distant for us because, thank the Lord, we're not under a sacrificial system anymore. So make it real for you. The same principle still applies. Think of all the ways that you and I try to absolve ourselves when we've done something wrong. Just think of all the ways that you and I try to justify ourselves someone says, you did that wrong, and I'm going to rationalize it, and I'm going to twist it, and I'm going to put it in the best possible light, and I'm going to have every extenuating circumstance, and I'm going to have every excuse, and I'm going to win this argument, and I am going to come out on top, and you will acknowledge my rightness, and you will see yourself as wrong, and I'm right. How many times do we try to put ourselves in the right? How many arguments do you have to have where you feel like you came out on top? to feel like you're right? <laughs> How many different ways do you need to justify yourself to finally feel right? How many good works do you have to do to feel like God finally accepts you? How many good things? How much church attendance? How many offerings? How many fill in the blank do we do? How many offerings do we make? Oh, they're not animals, but they're other things that we do to try and justify ourselves, to try and make up for our guilt, to try and make ourselves right, to try and put ourselves in the best possible light. And guys, it's a treadmill. It's just a treadmill where you're, you can run as hard and fast as you want, crank the speed all the way up, turn the incline up, Sweat, work up a sweat, running and running and running. But the thing about a treadmill is, you just run in place. <laughs> you don't actually get anywhere. And that's what this is. Trying to justify ourselves. Trying to offer God something that's going to make it right. Make us right. We're, you're not getting anywhere with God when we do that. We're just running in place and we can get stuck in that cycle of futility. So, what they needed back then is the same thing we need today. We need someone to rescue us from the futility of all this repetitiveness. 
And the gospel tells us that God has given us a Savior, a perfect priest who offered the perfect sacrifice to put an end to the never-ending cycle of offerings that you and I have that could never truly take away our sins, could never soothe the conscience, could never give assurance, could never really give us a felt peace with God. Jesus has done what we could never hope to do. And that's verses 12 through 14 in our passage. Verses 12 and 13 first. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. Just feel the contrast between verse 11 and verse 12. Where the same, every priest gets up every day, offers repeatedly the same offerings that never work. And then Christ appears and he offers, he's one priest, we don't need another. He offered one sacrifice, we don't need any other. He offered it one time for all time. He doesn't have to offer himself more than once. And he sat down. Have you ever thought about why we say Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father? He sitteth on the right hand of God. Well, yeah, that's in the Bible, but why is he sitting? Well, there's a couple reasons. One is because he's on a throne. He's king. That's verse 13. He's waiting until the time that his enemy should be made a footstool for his feet. He's ruling and reigning until all things are put in subjection under his feet. Yes, the kingship of Jesus, but the but the first reason in our passage that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father is because his work is done. It's over. He offered one sacrifice on the cross one time, and there's no more work for him to do. He finished his priestly work on earth. On the cross, he said, It is finished. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but when I used to get off work, I went home and I sat down. That's what getting off means to me. I finally get to sit because the job is done. So when Jesus offered his sacrifice on the cross, he clocked out. <laughs> he clocked out back to heaven, not for the day, but forever. Because it is finished. His work on earth is done. The sacrifice has been made that really can ransom, rescue, redeem us from our sins, can take away the sins, can make us right with God, can justify us before the Father, reconcile us to a holy God. Only He can do that. And He did it. And He did it perfectly and therefore, verse 14 says, For by a single offering, He has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Jesus has perfected you for all time by His once for all perfect sacrifice. And that means His life, His blood, His offering has taken away your sins truly, fully, finally. He has reconciled you to God and you now are justified fully, freely, forever by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And in chapter 9 of the letter, he says in verses 11 and 12, When Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. And because of that, you and I, it says, have been perfected for all 
time, meaning all of your sins have been perfectly dealt with in the perfect sacrifice of Jesus. And that means good news for us. No more animal sacrifices. That's a relief. If we had to march animals up here every week, <laughs> not in the nice petting zoo way, but like ritual sacrifice, this would be an empty will. A couple of you weirdos might still come. <laughs> but this, right, nobody wants to be a part of that. Nobody. Jesus freed us, freed them, freed us from the constant repetition of having to sacrifice animals. Christ freed us from this cycle. And in place of the sacrificial system, he gave us one thing that's very simple to do. He gave us communion. Communion is not a sacrifice. Communion is a sign and a seal of this new covenant that we have with God that Jesus made with us when he sacrificed himself. Communion is now a reminder, but not like those old sacrifices that were a reminder of sins. Oh, another animal is going to have to be sacrificed tomorrow or next year. No, we don't offer any more sacrifices. Communion's a reminder, not of futility, but of the once for all perfect sacrifice of Christ. A reminder that all our sins have truly been forgiven by His blood once for all. We have been fully justified by His blood. And communion reminds us that the perfect sacrifice has been, has been made by the perfect Savior. And we don't need any other sacrifices. We just need that one. So we keep going back to Him and Him alone. Hallelujah. We're not just freed from this cycle of futile sacrifices, but we're also freed from this cycle of futility where we feel like we have to justify ourselves. And what a transformation this will have in your marriages and in your friendships and your relationships with children and parents and extended family and friends and coworkers and church members. I don't have to fight for my rightness anymore. I don't have to fight to make myself look right and you look wrong. I don't have to win this argument at all costs. I don't have to feel like I'm in the right. I don't have to justify myself anymore. I don't have to offer God all the reasons why he should go easy on me. All the reasons he should like me. All the reasons he should forgive me. Me, 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 me. God, I'm so sick of me. <laughs> I need to get me out of the equation. And just look to Christ and see him on the tree bearing all my condemnation, justifying me perfectly. The blood flowed once on that hill and it never flows again because it's precious and it's perfect and it saves perfectly forever. And now I don't have to feel like I got to make myself right at all costs. Now I can just accept when I'm wrong. Now I can just freely forgive. Oh, the freedom that brings to get off that treadmill and just be still and know that he is God. He gives you rest. He lets you get off the treadmill. And he gives you rest and peace. Oh, that is so precious. And finally, Christ, he frees us from feeling the futility of the repetitiveness of our everyday lives. Back to those dishes. <laughs> Back to that vacuum cleaner. Back to that grocery list. Back to those pets. Back to whatever it is that you have to do every single day that can feel like in our world a trap that you're stuck in, that can feel like futility, that can feel heavy, that you can start to feel such boredom and such frustration and such discontent in your life. Jesus can free you from that as well. Now, you still got to do the dishes. <laughs> you still got to vacuum the floor. But you no longer have to experience it as this burden. Now, you can let your everyday, in and out, seemingly never-ending tedium and tasks 
remind you that, yeah, you're still working now, but there is one who said it's finished, and his work is finished, and he clocked out, and he's sitting down, and he's at the right hand of God for you now, interceding with his own perfect, precious blood. And now I can vacuum with a smile, <laughs> and I can think, yeah, Jesus' work is finished, and one day I will enter into his rest, and we will all be finished as well, and we'll be in his presence, enjoying his rest. And man, that can make every day feel sweet. That can make the tedium feel like, it might sound impossible, but feel like something of a joy. That's how you build Jesus into your daily life, is you let the little things you're doing remind you of him and let it be a springboard to make you worship. Transform how you experience your daily life in the midst of your work, you're reminded that his work is finished and his work is for you. And he has a rest promised for you that this world can't touch. Enter into the joy of your master, good and faithful servant. That's what we're looking for. And we can taste that a little bit now and one day, fully and forever. All of life can become sacred. All of your life can become holy. You can meet God right in the midst of life, when you look at him, the perfect priest who said it is finished, who did it all for you. That's the gospel. That's the hope that we have in him. His blood has washed away your sin. His blood washes away your frustration, your boredom. His blood washes away the futility of life and everything is full of glorious meaning and purpose. So look for him, Christian. Look for him in your daily lives and let it just absolutely change how you live. Because if you start doing this kind of stuff, you'll really start walking with Jesus every day. And what a difference that will make. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the gift of a Christ who's with us every day for the gift of a Savior whose work is finished, whose work is perfect, who never has, and never has to be repeated. And we pray that you would make it sweet in our minds, sweet in our hearts, that you would send us out from this place to think about and dwell upon and meditate about all the different ways of seeing a Christ who has offered the perfect sacrifice, how that can affect and change how we experience ourselves and our lives. May the chores we do this evening and the tasks we have ahead this week and all the little in and out details, may they cause us to be reminded not of futility, but reminded of the finished work of Christ. And may that sweeten our own work. And may it give us such rest that we are fully accepted, fully saved, fully washed clean and new because of Christ alone. And oh, let that give us joy to endure our own lives and the difficulties that they have and to do it with joy and with gratitude. And may we walk closely with you and feel your presence every day as we do so. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.